Okay, this is part nine of Nosferatu, Two, The Road to Christmas Land. The day had fled and the headlights of the wraith bored into a frozen darkness. White flecks raced through the glare, t ticked softly against the windshield. Now this is snow, Charlie Mannix cried from behind the steering wheel. Bing had snapped from drowsiness to full wakefulness in a moment, as if consciousness were a switch and someone had flicked it on. His blood seemed to surge all at once toward his heart. He could not have been more shocked if he'd woken to find a grenade in his lap. Half the sky was smothered over with clouds, but the other half was plentiful sugared with stars, and the moon hung above them. The moon with the hooked nose and broad, smiling mouth. It considered the road below with a yellow sliver of eye showing beneath one drooping light. Deformed firs lined the road. Bing had to look twice before he realized they were not pines at all, but gumdrop trees. Christmas land, Bing whispered. No, Charlie Minnick said. We are a long way off. Twenty hours of driving at least. But it is out there. It's in the west. And once a year, Bing, I take someone there. Me? Bing asked in a quivering voice. No, Bing, Charlie said gently. Not this year. All children are welcome in Christmas land, but grown-ups are a different case. You must prove your worth first. You must prove your love of children and your devotion to protecting them and serving Christmas land. They passed a snowman who lifted a twig arm and waved. Bing reflexively lifted his hand to wave in return. How? he whispered. You must save ten children with me, Bing. You must save them from monsters. Monsters? What monsters? Their parents, Mannix said solemnly. Bing removed his face from the icy glass of the passenger window and looked around at Charlie Mannix. When he had shut his eyes a moment earlier, there had been sunlight in the sky and Mr. Mannix had been dressed in a plain white shirt and suspenders. Now, though, he had on a coat with tails and a dark cap with a leather with a black leather brim. The coat had a double line of brass buttons and seemed like the sort of thing an officer from a foreign country might wear, a lieutenant in a royal guard. When Bing glanced down at himself, he saw he also wore new clothes, his father's crisp white marine dress uniform, boots polished into a black shine. Am I dreaming? Bing asked. asked. I told you, Mannix said, the road to Christmas land is paved in dreams. This old car can slip right out of the everyday world and onto the street, um, onto the secret roads of thought. Sleep is just the exit ramp. When a passenger dozes off, my wraith leaves whatever road it was on and slides onto the St. Nick Parkway. We are sharing this dream together. It is your dream, Bang, but it is still my ride. Come, I want to show you something. As he had been speaking, the car was slowly, was slowing and easing toward the side of the road. Snow crunched under the tires. The headlights illuminated a figure just up the road on the right. From a distance, it looked like a woman in a white gown. She stood very still, did not glance into the lights of the wraith. Mannix leaned over and popped the glove compartment above Bing's knees. Inside was the usual mess of roadmaps and papers. Bing also saw a flashlight with a long chrome handle. An orange medicine bottle rolled out of the glove compartment. Bing caught it in one hand. It said, Handsome Dewey, Valium 50 milligrams. Manning gripped the flashlight, straightened up, and opened his door a crack. We have to walk from here. Bing held up the bottle. Did you? Did you give me something to make me sleep, Mr. Mannix? Mannix winked. Don't hold it against me, Bing. I knew you'd want to get on the road to Christmas Land as soon as possible. And that could... And that you could see it only when you were asleep. I hope it's all right. Bing said, I guess I don't mind. And shrugged. He looked at the bottle again. Who's Dewey Handsome? He was you, Bing. He was my pre-Bing thing. Dewey Handsome was a screen agent in Los Angeles who specialized in child actors. He helped me save ten children and earned his place in Christmas Land. Oh, the children of Christmas Land loved Dewey Bing. They absolutely ate him up. Come along. Bing unlatched his door and climbed out into the still frozen air. The night was windless and the snow spun down in, so in slow flakes kissing his cheeks. For an old man, why do I keep thinking he's old? Bing win wondered. He doesn't look old. Charlie Mannix was spry, legging ahead along the side of the road, his boots squealing. Bing tramped after him, hugging himself in his thin dress uniform. 
It wasn't one woman in a white gown, but two flanking a black iron gate. They were identical, ladies carved from glassy marble. They both leaned forward, spreading their arms, and their flowing bone-white dresses billowed behind them, opening like the wings of angels. They were serenely beautiful, with the full mouths and blind eyes of classical statuary. Their lips were parted, so they appeared to be in mid-gasp. Lips turned in a way that suggested they were about to laugh or cry it in pain. Their sculptor had fashioned them so their breasts were pressing against the fabric of their gowns. Mannix passed through the black gate between the ladies. Bing hesitated, and his right hand came up, and he struck the top of one of those smooth, cold bosoms. He had always wanted to touch a breast that looked like that, a firm, full, mommy breast. The stone lady's smile widened, and Bing leaped back, a cry rising from his throat. Come along, Bing. Let's be about our business. You aren't dressed for this cold, Mannix shouted. Bing was about to step forward, then hesitated to look at the arch over the open iron gate. Graveyard of what might be. Bing frowned at this mystifying statement, but then Mr. Mannix called again, and he, and he hurried along. Four stone steps, lightly sprinkled in snow, led down to a flat plain of black ice. The ice was grainy with the recent snowfall, but the flakes were not deep. Any kick of the boot would reveal the smooth sheet of ice beneath. He had gone two steps when he saw something cloudy caught in the ice about three inches below the surface. At first glance, it looked like a dinner plate. Bing bent and looked through the ice. Charlie Mannix, who was only a few paces ahead, turned back and pointed the flashlight at the spot where he was looking. The glow of the beam lit the face of a child, a girl with freckles on her cheeks and her hair in pigtails. At the sight of her, Bing screamed and took an uneasy, an unsteady step back. She was as pale as the marble statues guarding the entrance to the graveyard of what might be, but she was flesh, not stone. Her mouth was open in a silent shout, a few frozen bubbles drifting from her lips. Her hands were raised as if she were reaching up to him. In one was a bunch of red coiled rope. A jump rope, Bing recognized. It's a girl, he cried. It's a dead girl in the ice. Not dead, Bing, Mannix said. Not yet. Maybe not for years. Mannix flicked the flashlight away and pointed it toward a white stone cross tilting up from the ice. Lily Carter, 15 Fox Road, Sharpsville, Pennsylvania, 1982, question mark? turned to a life of sin by her mother her childhood ended before it began if only there had been another to take her off to christmas land Mannix swept his light around what bing now perceived was a frozen lake on which were ranked rows of crosses a cemetery the size of arlington the snow girl the snow scrolled around the memorials the plinus the emptiness in the moonlight the snowflakes looked like silver shavings Bing peered again at the girl at his feet. He stared up through the clouded ice and blinked. He screamed once more, stumbling away. The backs of his legs struck another cross, and he half spun, lost his footing, and went down on all fours. He gazed through the dull ice. Mannix turned his flashlight on the face of another child, a boy with sensitive, thoughtful eyes beneath pale bangs. William Delman, 42B Mattinson Avenue, Ashbury Park, New Jersey, 1981-2, question mark. Billy only ever wanted to play, but his father didn't stay. His mother ran away. Drugs, knives, grief, and dismay. If only someone had saved the day. Bing tried to get up, did a comical soft shoe, went down again a little to the left. The ray of Mannix's flashlight showed him another child, an Asian girl, clutching a stuffed bear in a tweed jacket. Sarah Show, 1983 to 39th 5th Street, Banger M.E., I think it's Maine. I don't know. <laughs> Sarah lives in a tragic dream, will hang herself by age 13, but think how she will give such thanks if she goes for a ride with Charlie Mannix. Bing made a gobbling, gasping sound of horror. The girl, Sarah Show, stared up at him, mouth open in a silent cry. She had been buried in the ice with a clothesline twisted around her throat. Charlie Mannix caught Bing's elbow and helped him up. I'm sorry you had to see all this, Bing. Mannix said, I wish I could have spared you, but you needed to understand the reasons for my work. Come back to the car. I have a thermos of cocoa. Mr. Mannix helped Bing across the ice, his hand squeezing Bing's upper arm to keep him from falling again. They separated at the hood of the car and Charlie went on to the driver's side door, but Bing hesitated for an instant. 
Noticing for the first time the hood ornament, a grinning lady fashioned from chrome, her arms spread so that her gown flowed back from her body like wings. He recognized her in a glance. She was identical to the angels of mercy who guarded the gate of the cemetery. When they were in the car, Charlie Mannix reached beneath his seat and came up with a silver thermos. He removed the cap, filled it with hot chocolate, and handed it over. Bing clasped it in both hands, sipping at that scalding sweetness, while Charlie Mannix made a wide sweeping turn away from the graveyard of what might be. They accelerated back the way they had come. Tell me about Christmas land, Bing said in a shaking voice. It is the best place, Mannix said. With all due respect to Mr. Walt Disney, Christmas land is the true happiest place in the world. Although, from another point of view, I suppose you could say it is the happiest place not in this world. In Christmas land, every day is Christmas, and the children there never feel anything like unhappiness. No, the children there don't even understand the concept of unhappiness. There is only fun. It is like heaven, only of course they are not dead. They live forever, remain children for eternity, and are never forced to struggle and sweat and demean themselves like us poor adults. I discovered this place a pure dream many years ago, and the first wee ones to take up residence there were my own children, who were saved before they could be destroyed by the pitiful, angry thing their mother had become in her later years. It is truly a place where the impossible happens every day, but it is a place for children, not adults. Only a few grown-ups are allowed to live there. Only those who have shown devotion to a higher cause. Only those who are willing to sacrifice everything for the well-being and happiness of the tender little ones. People like you, Bang. I wish with all my heart that all the children in the world could find their way to Christmas land, where they would know safety and happiness beyond measure. Oh boy, that would be something. But few adults would consent to send their children away with a man they have never met to a place they cannot visit. Why, they would think me the most heinous sort of kidnapper and kitty fiddler. So, I bring only one or two children a year, and they are always children I have seen in the graveyard of what might be. Good children are sure to suffer at the hands of their own parents. As a man who was hurt terribly as a child himself, you understand, I'm sure, how important it is to help them. The graveyard shows me children who will, if I do nothing, have their childhood stolen by their mothers and fathers. They will be hit with chains, fed cat food, sold to perverts. Their souls will turn to ice and they will become cold, unfeeling people, sure to destroy children themselves. We are their one chance, Bang. In my years as the keeper of Christmas Land, I have saved some 70 children and it is my feverish wish to save a hundred more before I am done. The car rushed through the cold cavernous dark. Bang moved his lips, counting to himself. Seventy, he murmured. I thought you only had to rescue one child a year. Seventy, he murmured. I thought you had to only rescue one child a year, maybe two. Yes, Manic said. That is about right. But how old are you? Bang asked. Manic grinned sidelong at him, revealing that crowded mouthful of sharp brown teeth. My work keeps me young. Finish your cocoa, Bang. Bing swallowed the last hot, sugary mouthful, then swirled the remnants. There was a milky yellow residue there. He wondered if he had just swallowed something else from the medicine cabinet of Dewey Hampson, a name that sounded like a joke or a name in a limerick. Dewey Hampson, Charlie Mannix's pre-Bang thing, who had saved ten children and gone to this eternal reward in Christmas land. If Charlie Mannix had saved seventy kids, then there had been, what, seven... Pre-bang things, the lucky dogs. He heard a rumbling, the crash, rattle, and 12-cylinder whine of a big truck coming up behind them. He looked back. The sound was rising in volume with each passing moment, but could see nothing. Do you hear that? Bing asked, unaware that the empty lid of the thermos had slipped from his suddenly tingly fingers. Do you hear something? That would be the morning, Manic said, pulling up on us fast. Don't look now, Bang. Here it comes. The truck were built and built, and suddenly it was pulling them. It was pulling by them on Bing's left. Bing looked out into the night and could see the side of a big panel truck quite clearly, only a foot or two away. Painted on the sun was a green field, a red farmhouse, a scattering of cows, and a bright, smiling sun coming up over the hills. The rays of that rising sun lit foot-high lettering, sunrise delivery. 
For an instant, the truck obscured the land and sky in sunrise delivery filled Bing's entire visual field. Then it rolled rattling on, dragging a rooster tail of dust, and Bing flinched from an almost painfully blue morning sky, a sky without cloud, without limit, and squinted into...